Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Well Nerds Podcast. This is episode 135. My name is Slater, and I'm here with Caitlin. Aloha. We're back. Are we? I don't know. Are we? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just want to start off with our normal um, thank yous and announcements and all that good stuff because it's been a while. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for listening to the podcast, for supporting us on Patreon, um, for going on trips, and for um, supporting us either by buying merch or anything like that as well, or rating, reviewing, or sharing the podcast. All that really helps get the word out, and we really appreciate it. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And Caitlin actually saw a uh, Whale Nerds shirt out in the out in the wild. <laughs> right? I did. Yeah, I had um, uh, Kylie came to Maui with her family and she messaged me on Instagram and was like, oh, I want to come on a trip. And um, I was like, OK, cool. I'll see. You. you know, we figured out what trip she was going to be on. And then I was like, how am I going to figure out who this person is? And then she walked up with a whale nerd shirt on. And I was like, oh, perfect. I know exactly who it is. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting a uh, t-shirt. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, they actually, they actually look pretty good. The color she chose, uh, or I guess her friends bought it for her. Um, I was like, it's kind of similar color to the logo, but the way it's like outlined with the silk screen, it looks nice. So nice. it was cool to see one of our shirts out in the wild. Ah, oh, that's awesome. <sighs> so um, yeah, so just a little updates for us. Um, our 2023 podcast schedule, we're probably going to do two episodes a month just because we both have quite a heavy workload um, coming up this year. And so we want to make sure we're giving ourselves time to rest and produce a nice podcast. And so we're going to go down to twice a month. Um, but yeah, you're always welcome to still like interact with us online, email us questions, whatever you want to do. Um, we're going to still have our blog be active throughout the year. Um, we do have trips coming up in April, so less than a month away now. And there's still plenty of space available for Friday and Saturday. So if you would like to join us for my birthday or for Earth Day, either one, we'd love to see you in Moss Landing. Um, there are six-hour trips. We're going to be looking for killer whales, but um, also we're definitely going to see humpback whales, possibly dolphins, cool seabirds maybe ocean sunfish, maybe blue whales, fin whales, who knows? Springtime is really good to see a wide variety of wildlife in Monterey. So that's why we like to run those trips that time of year. I'm hoping it's going to be a crazy year just because we've had such bad weather. I feel like, I know, I feel like the ocean is obligated to give it. us something. <laughs> <laughs> we just, I don't want to say we deserve it because it's like, that's just rude, but we're, you're obligated to give us something back. Oh, okay. That sounds worse. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, yeah i'm really hoping that we have like just like because we still even had bad weather the last few days and it's march 20 what fourth fifth yeah so um i'm hoping this winter weather pattern is done pretty soon because otherwise i mean how are you guys going to get your upwelling season going if you keep having these big storms come across from the southwest yeah and my first trip is on april 1st actually so hopefully it's good yeah like Seven days to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Seven days. I think they all went today. They some of them went yesterday. I guess it, I guess yeah. it was good inside the bay to the north. So yeah. Um, well, yeah, and leaving we'll out of Moss Landing, it's a little more sheltered as long as the harbor mouth is not crazy. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and then also, if you want to get some merch, like Kylie had, so we can see you out in the wild. Because that's another way to support us. You can do that on our website, which is thewhalenerds.com. And then we also have video versions of our uh, episodes on our YouTube. So if you want to watch on YouTube instead of listening on a podcast platform, you're welcome to do that. That's all the announcements. Yeah, I want to know um, how many people watch YouTube. I'm curious, actually. I, we I actually, it's analytics. been slowly growing. We have like 140 subscribers or something like that episodes get like 10 to 20 views nice so yeah all right hit hit us with it caitlin i know you've been seeing some oh that video that you sent me which i forgot yeah. to respond to which i i do Rude. that so much when any and when anytime <laughs> someone sends me a video of something usually it's a whale or something cool and then i show it to margo <laughs> and then my you wife forget. i show it to margo and then 
I forget to respond to the actual person I sent it. <laughs> You're like, this is so cool. Look at this. And then you don't say that to yeah, the person. Yeah, because I remember I was in bed and I was like, babe, I was like, but this isn't with the hydromone. This is just through the water. <laughs> like through the whole <laughs> the boat. Yeah, so uh, March is like baby whale month. Like they're just everywhere and they're not tucked in on the shoreline anymore because they're all getting big and getting ready to go to Alaska or Russia or Canada, wherever they're going. And so there's just moms and calves everywhere. Um, we've also had a lot of competition groups. I had a couple competition groups in the last two weeks that were double digits, like 10, 15 whales. So pretty awesome to see uh, that many whales chasing each other around and battling it out. I had two whales right next to the boat body slam each other during one of the competition groups. It was Dang. awesome. So, um did it look aggressive oh yeah it was like <laughs> just like one whale came up and the other one just like wham down on the top of it and Ooh. it was like they were both it was like a half breach they were both that far out of the water when they Damn. did it. yeah it's like oh, that's i a can't wait for i literally just can't wait for humpback whales they're so amazing <laughs> come back already there's some around there's some yeah around. i was gonna say there should be some out there already My, by march they're showing up and starting to be hungry now in monterey yeah um, so we've had some really good competition action and then we've still had pretty decent whale song pretty much everywhere. Um, that video that you were talking about. So I was driving out of Ma'alaya and it was beautiful, flat, calm, which is like so uncommon for Ma'alaya. And I saw, I was like out in the middle between Molokini and the Harbor. And I was just looking for a singer. I was like, I've got to find one. I know there's one out here by itself. And I just kept finding moms and calves and moms and calves, and moms and calves. And I was like, oh my God. So finally I saw a whale dive and I was like, I'm pretty sure this one doesn't have a calf. I think it's a singer. And it was like a mile away. So I go up to where I think it dove. Cause I can see like one tiny little ripple left in the mm. fluke print. And I just turn the engines off. And as soon as I turn the engines off, we can hear it singing like so loud through the air. And then everybody's like oh my god this is so cool they start looking around and then we look off the port side of the boat and you could see the whale oh the water's so clear in maui yeah. and the whale wasn't uh, that far down either i mean you can i know see it looked like you were like it. yeah it looked it seemed very close because how clear it was huh yeah i mean i think it was maybe a body length down like 40 Dang. feet down it was just was its head down, right? It was like, yeah, it's it's tilted yeah. with its okay. head down. Um, it's like total classic singer yeah. posture, like everything that you describe a singer as. He was laying there motionless in the water column. He's kind of got like a droop down head at a 45 degree angle. His flippers are out to help him balance, and he's just singing his heart out down there. Good old singing. Yeah. So that was awesome. That's good. Yeah. That was Is probably it, uh, the coolest, so coolest how do you singer feel like encounter. Yeah. How do you feel like the season is, uh, is it coming to an end? Do you feel like, or is it still pretty solid? I mean, it's definitely tapering off. Like we're off the peak now, but like, I'm not struggling to find whales. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we're not at the point where I'm like, oh gosh, we might have to rain check these people. Not yet. I think. Oh, we'll you have had some rain checks. No, at the beginning of the season and the end of the season, we do sometimes though. Is but it cause, I is it cause there is like, just not any really around at all anymore, or is it you just didn't get to that one, I guess? Because there's probably – do you guys – okay, do you guys eventually just, like, cut off? Like, okay, we're not technically whale watching anymore. Yeah, so the beginning, well, of, this, do, but... the beginning of this season, quote-unquote, we say is, like, December 15th. So we might start whale watching by, like, December 1st and only run a few trips a week. And – those preseason trips, if we don't see whales, we give them a rain check. Um, and then at the end of the season, usually in Ma'alaya, we're done by like April 15th. And then Lahaina, we're done April 30th. Mm. Um, but it, either of those, if we start giving just a flukes, which is our rain check, um, if we start giving those a whole bunch of days in a row, then we might stop whale watching earlier and just call the people and explain like, this is what's going on. The whales are already gone, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but so far that hasn't happened, uh, but we're not even into April yet. So we'll see what happens. 
It's also really tough, like in Ma'alaya, towards the end of the season on windy days, it's really hard to find whales. Oh, yeah, I bet. So, uh, yeah, once it starts to blow like 25 knots, it's really hard to pick out like a calf at the surface. It might be there, but it's hard to stick with it and it's hard to watch it. God, and then they just point at Alaska and swim. Yep. No, no compass. No nope. chart. As far as well, as far as we know. <laughs> yeah, as far I really as we think... know, they have AI technology. <laughs> <laughs> They've been just like talking to the satellites. They have their own <laughs> satellites the whole time. Um, I really think the more years I work in Maui, I really think they can hear the islands. Like I think that's how they get here is they can hear the volcanic activity. They can hear the movement of the water around the region. They definitely can just, I think they just hear the island chain. That's how they get there. It's very weird to me, the whole like hearing thing, because it's like, if boats bothered them, they'd swim away, right? Like there's, there we have, there's just proof with any kind of vessel, there's proof of like friendly whales pretty much, you know, besides mm -hmm. maybe like, cargo ships or whatever mm -hmm. but there's like uh, proof even of, then we had a cruise yeah. ship and a whale was friendly with it a small cruise ship this season the safari yeah, i guess they, it just, it's just like mugged. who's curious like, like it just i mean depends on if the whales you know yeah curious or not but i don't know it's just like but then you think that they can hear the volcanic activity mm -hmm. so it's like is their hearing so good or is it selective hearing or what you know what i mean can they shut it down what do you know? Yeah. Can, they close, can they close their ears a little bit? No, they're just like little pinholes on the side of their head. They don't. Have I know, any but muscle. on the inside, do they have? They don't have any muscles that they could just like. I don't think so, because their ear canal is like full of wax. Mm. Do you know so, when you yawn, your ears like pop? You can't. You, you can't hear either when you're yeah. yawning. Maybe they just. I don't yawn. know. I think it's more of just a tolerance thing more than anything. But yeah, it's hard. It's hard to tell and. Here's the other thing I'll say about the end of whale season that'll make it tricky to pull off trips sometimes is sometimes I do see animals that don't want the boat around. Like they turn away from you a couple times and you're like, okay, I'm going to leave this whale alone. I mean, I do. I'm not saying everyone does, but that's a good indicator of like a whale that doesn't want to be watched. And like, you've got to have the wisdom as a captain to be like, okay, these animals are here and we don't see any other animals, but we're not going to harass them just because we want to see them. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the season, that starts to happen a lot too. We're like moms. Are well, like, it's because up. if you think about it, there's a lot of operations and then you get down to six whales or two whales in that, yeah. like in that yeah. whale watch range. Yeah. And if everyone's like, even if they're on off schedules, it's like, they're all going to that whale to say hi to it and go and yeah. then leave. So. Yeah, and that's starting to happen a lot more too. That now that we're getting towards the end of the season, whales are further spread out, and so when you do find a whale, another boat inevitably comes to you. Which, if there's something crazy cool happening, yeah, I'm all for it. Like, get a couple more boats over here and watch it for a few minutes. But it's like when you're just watching two sleeping whales, and there's four boats there when there's other whales around like why yeah. you know so but that i mean that happens at the end of the beginning and the end of the season like often here um i always try and because i'm up on a taller boat i always try and just take the high road and go find another whale um if i can because i don't want to just compound the issue but yeah that's kind of a struggle at the end of the season is like a bunch of boats on a few whales that are at the end of their energy reserves and stuff so you know, just trying to have best practices while you're out there and then also convey that to guests. Because often when I leave whales, like guests are like, what are you doing? They're still right there. I'm like, calm down. I have a plan. <laughs> yeah. Usually. Can we get closer than this? <laughs> or they look at a small boat and they're like, why are they so close? I'm like, we're the same distance apart, but it's tricky with the perspective on the water. Yep. <laughs> so. Okay. So. Um, a lot of our naturalists over at Paclil have started to talk more about the breeding grounds in Japan because it is part of the North Pacific um, breeding grounds. There's five kind of areas um, across the North Pacific, and there is new science coming out of Japan about the breeding grounds 
Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about it because I was curious about it after hearing our naturalist talk about it on the microphone. And then I found this paper that was published about five months ago. That's pretty interesting um, to hear about the uh, whales that go over there. Also, because I don't think I've said on the podcast yet, this summer I'm going to work on a ship in Alaska. You are? I am. <laughs> And um, part of our route goes kind of far up and around the Aleutians. And so some of these whales that I might encounter might be swimming over to Japan instead of Hawaii. Wait, you're going towards the Aleutian Islands? We're going to kind of cut through the middle of the Aleutian Island chain and go up into the, like, Chukchi Wait, Sea. what? And go up to, like, Nome and stuff. What? Yeah, dude. Is that trip sold out? No. Dang, I'm going to have to book that. Wait, you're really going to go? I wonder where you cross through at. False Pass? Um, It's on their website. I can show you later. No, I need to know now. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. Dang. Maybe you you could see. Well, I don't know how far up you'll go, but maybe you could see gray whales. Yeah, I think we will see gray whales. Thing in the feeding grounds yeah and Isn't i don't ca- so cool? i don't ca- i don't count oregon as like i mean i get wow, it dude, i get it i'm sorry but like that's some real deal fe- feeding grounds up there <laughs> oh that's cool what if you get nice. seasick dude I, I mean whatever it's gonna be a cool place <laughs> if i get seasick i get seasick oh that's so cool also, you could swim with humpbacks in Japan. I just don't know how to read about it or look into it right <laughs> as of, as of right now. But I do see, uh, like, I do see photos coming out of underwater stuff coming out of there, in uh, from like Okinawa. Yeah, which is a breeding ground. We'll talk mm-hmm. about it here in a minute. Let me see if I can find this. Um, yeah. Very northbound. I mean, it's so remote up there. Past there, do you know? Um, so we leave from Vancouver, British Columbia, and we work our way up the inside passages of um, British Columbia and Alaska. And then we have um, one cruise route that goes all the way up to Nome. Oh, it's this 18-day cruise. Here we go. Leaves July 2nd. You want to go for your birthday? Oh. <laughs> um, so we cut through that sucks I, I actually do i already have tickets so i have to go to see someone and go through towards like saint paul oh we're gonna cross the date line and then go back across the date line that's confusing all right we get it you're going to alaska you're leaving us behind are you showing me on the map uh, i'm trying to show you but it won't show what's your, this, what's the company called i can look it up heard of Gruden. i'll text you the link heard of Gruden. all right back to reality anyways Okay, so I was curious about all these things because it's semi-relevant to me. And then also I just was curious and there was new science. So I was like, perfect. That's exactly how I choose our podcast topics. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's curious about how that process works. Okay, so we're just going to cover one paper, but there are uh, there are quite a few papers kind of looking at this right now over the last couple of years. And this was sort of touched on way back when during the splash project as well. Um, They did get some samples of whales that were um, from these breeding grounds over off Japan and Philippines, but they just didn't get a lot of detailed information about it. So this paper was published in November in Plus One, and it's called Interchanges and Movements of Humpback Whales in Japanese Waters, Okinawa, Ogasawara, Amami, and Hokkaido using an automated matching system. So in the western North Pacific, the waters around Ogasawara, Okinawa, Amami, Oshima, and the Philippines and the Mariana Archipelago are known breeding areas for humpback whales. So um, when you look at the furthest north location we're going to talk about is just coming down off of um, the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, just north of the main Japan island is Hokkaido. And um, this area is actually, gonna, we're going to find out more like a, a pass-through area, um, but there are lots of whale watching tours there. We've yes. actually talked about it before with the Shiratoko cruises. Yes. We really want to go there. Anyways, 
<laughs> so got all furthest, sorts of stuff. furthest north is Hokkaido. Then as you come down um, off of Japan, you can kind of either split to the southwest, and that's Amami and Okinawa. Or you can split like south, a little bit southeast, and that's Ogasawara. And then further south, even more from Ogasawara is the Marianas. And then further south from Amami and Okinawa is the Philippines. So I'll try and kind of reference the locations of where we are throughout the um, episode just to kind of help keep track of like where these whales are going. So there were studies done in the past that show that there are breeding areas in the Western North Pacific, and they think that they are all one population because there were humpback whales observed among all the different areas in the region, um, like between Ogasawara and Okinawa and the Philippines. And then there were some exchange between the Mariana Archipelago and the other regions of Japan. There is a pretty significant difference, though, in their DNA um, between Ogasawara and both Okinawa and the Philippines, and then also between the Marianas Archipelago and Okinawa and the Philippines. So a straight line down is Okinawa and the Philippines, and then a straight line down is Ogasawara and the Mariana Archipelago. Um so then people were starting to say, okay, based on genetics, maybe there are several subpopulations in this region of breeding grounds. Dang. Um, so is that kind of like our Maui, California, like that kind of thing? I think it's more I like mean, Maui, Mexico? Mexico and Central America. So like, like, yeah, like, yeah, so Costa Rica and. Yeah, like the locations aren't that far apart and there is some exchange when you do the photo IDs. But then when you look at their genetics, they are sort of So the ones separate. that go to Antarctica are different than the ones that go to – like their genetics look a little different than the ones that go to California. Yeah, I mean, they're fairly closely related, um, so like weird. the whales in Central America and Mexico. But anyways, there hasn't been a lot of science done yet, whereas like down on the eastern North Pacific, we're doing a lot of science with those whales. So this is like the first – attempt to like get a whole picture but like of what's what happening. part of their dna is different i don't understand that if they're just a humpback yeah so there's these um little things that are called haplotype markers in their mitochondrial dna which is what they get from their grandma and so that kind of shows those little details in the dna kind of show how much interbreeding there is between whales shows how fam like how much of a family they are versus a species Mm. does that make sense like family i mean in the common term like how relate are y'all cousins or like you know and they are they're all cousins well there's actually the dna right now is saying there there might be two distinct populations in there but then the photo ids show that the whales are moving between all the locations so now i gotta try and figure it out Dang. confusion so well also i wonder if that's why we get them going between breeding grounds yeah, could be. Yeah. He's like, ah, oh, this is a bunch. Of this is all my cousins are here. I'm out. Yeah. I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> I've seen all you people. I'm going before. to Philippines. <laughs> I've been here. <laughs> so, um, part of how they defined all these areas as breeding grounds is they have seen a lot of mother and calf pairs, as well as mature individuals, repeatedly observed every year during the winter season, and not just passing through but staying and utilizing those areas for more than a few days at a time during the winter. Um, they have also seen competitive groups of more than three whales um, and in those areas as well. So um, they have some sighting records of humpback whales off the southeastern side of Hokkaido. And a whale that was seen in that area was also seen in Okinawa. And so they think that Hokkaido is more of a migratory corridor for whales between the feeding grounds and the breeding grounds. Hmm. Um, they, I think it's in here somewhere. Um, they think Hokkaido is a potential feeding ground, but they don't have any evidence right now of humpback whales feeding in the area. But it's definitely a corridor that the whales use. Um, so far, there have been no studies conducted on the interchange of humpback whales among the different regions in Japan. Mm. 
And um, there's a really big collaboration done during this study between research groups and tour operators to compile catalogs and be able to compare them. So um, Hokkaido University, Ogasawara Marine Science Center, Everlasting Nature of Asia, um, Ogasawara Whale Watching Association, Amami Whale and Dolphin Association, Okinawa Research Center, and Okinawa Foundation. So lots of different groups got involved over the last 30 years to compile wow. these catalogs and try and make sense of this, which is pretty awesome. I mean, some of those like in Amami, they've been whale watching since 92. So there's been a long history of whale watching in some of these areas. It's like 31 years of of whale watching. So pretty incredible. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Like everybody wants to like villainize Japan because they're still whaling. But some of these areas switched to whale watching the same time we did on the West Coast. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, well, it's just like Iceland. Same thing. Yeah. Except for, yeah, it's basically the same thing. Yeah. Like there's a certain area in Japan that still whales, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of places that you can go for tourism. Yeah. Which we need to go. I know. How do we pull that off? Well, now's the time because it's it's extremely cheap to travel there. Yeah. Relatively. I mean, it's expensive, but it's like the, our money is up. The so. dollar is good. It's stronger than theirs. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to figure it out. Oh, so many places to see whales. So many things. Okay. So all these groups got together. They compared their catalogs between four different areas. And um, they developed their own fluke matching system. So a lot of these re researchers are now also using Happy Whale. Um, but for this um, paper, they use their own system developed by Osaka University. Mm. Actually, it was a collaboration, Osaka University, Kiyo University, and OCF. Um, and it was a deep learning and precision decisions of image processing. So fairly similar concept to how Happy Whales developed. So overall, they had 486 matches confirmed between the four regions, three matches between Hokkaido and Okinawa. So very small sample size, but there were whales matched between Hokkaido and Okinawa. There were 36 matches between Ogasawara and Amami, 225 matches between Ogasawara and Okinawa, 222 matches between Amami and Okinawa. There were no matches between Hokkaido and Ogasawara or Amami in this study. So Amami and Okinawa are like right next to each other. Wow. So having 200 plus matches between those locations, that makes sense. The interesting part comes in the breakdown between the east-west regions. Um, let's see, where am I now? So 20 individuals were observed in all three breeding areas, Ogasawara, Amami, and Okinawa, in different years. Um, and of these, some individuals had a preference to migrate to either Ogasawara or Okinawa, which are separated by quite a distance from east to west. Um, but some of them migrated almost the same number of times to each place. So some of them preferred to go to one, but would go to the other. And then others were like every few years they would mix it up. Yeah. Um, overall, fewer whales were seen in Amami compared to other locations over the years of study. And, um, they found that in more than two different areas, Within or across different years, there was more likely to be males versus females moving between the regions. Um, but they were on, they were only able to get a determination of male or female on about half of the individuals in the study. So there is some room for bias there. So 100 different individuals were observed in two different regions within the same season. When you look at Ogasawara, Amami, and Okinawa, um, only one individual was seen going between east or west between Ogasawara and Amami. Those two are the furthest apart. Um, 
So it's it it kind of makes sense that they don't change around as much um, east to west like that because it's a far distance. But um, more whales come from Okinawa and go to Ogasawara than whales go from Amami to Ogasawara, which is weird because it's not that much different. Like if you look at the map, it's like kind of the same diff distance. Well, is it maybe it depends on like if they're southbound, you know what I mean? Yeah, but Amami and Okinawa are right on top of each other. And then you have to go east to Ogasawara. Wait. If so wait, say, so if they go to Amami, they're unlikely to go to Okinawa. The no, those two spots they go back and forth. But when you look at east west to Ogasawara, like, oh, okay. A lot of whales will compare to Amami. A lot of whales go from Okinawa to Ogasawara or back. I guess maybe it's more of a straight line, um, but they don't exchange as much between Amami and Ogasawara. Yeah. I don't know what that's about. They got that's their a own little further. Little, they got their own little preferences, I guess. Yeah, um. Good. So within um. 13 cases with 11 unique individuals were observed going between Ogasawara and Okinawa in the same season. Um, and it took between 21 and 100 days to change between the two regions based on photo ID studies. So it's an average of 42 days, which is interesting because it doesn't look that far. And then you think about like the humpbacks that went between mexico and hawaii and it was like 50 days or something yeah and it's like what are you doing lollygagging for a hundred days like where were you maybe you just Enjoy maybe the researchers just didn't weather. see them <laughs> maybe the researchers just didn't see them like they were there and that they didn't get photographed until 100 days later yeah that's weird so um there were lots of cases of um Humpback whales going between Amami and Okinawa it was 100 cases with 88 unique individuals going between the two locations fairly close together in the same year. Which that makes sense because it's not that far apart. Um, it, the shortest time period it took between each location there was four days and the longest was 69 days. The average it took about 16, 17 days to go between. Well... I'll bet you is there food. That's what we don't know, right? Like, so if there's food, they could stop and eat for a couple of days. Yeah, we don't know. And those regions, like, when you look at the map, like, Ogasawara is one, two, three, four, like, islands that they study in that region. So, like, the whales could have been there for a while before someone saw them. So there's a lot of little nooks and crannies to check. It would be so amazing to follow a whale from any distance. Like, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like, I, 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 I don't know. Like, I don't care about following a whale from, like, Monterey to San Francisco, but following it from, like, Maui to Alaska or something. Yeah. Or even, like, yeah, I don't know. One of these sounds really cool because they're not that far, but they're far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, oh, they just point at it. I don't, I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> um, and so basically, if you want to get into like the, the nitty gritty details of how the whales are moving in each region, they were going east west, they were going west east. Um, it's discussed more in detail in the paper. There was a little bit of like some timing information and like movements and things like that. Um, but it like you could get really bogged down at if down in it if you're not looking at the graphics at the same time but whales are there's flow either way between the sites it's not like they all go from okinawa to ogasawara like they go back and forth how they want so after looking at all of this information and combining it with previous studies what this paper is saying is that um, it's been suggested that humpback whales in okinawa feed mainly off of the Kam kamchakta peninsula in russia in the summer and their early arrival in Okinawa during the breeding season has been confirmed during the month of uh, December. 
the discovery of the same individuals in Hokkaido and Okinawa indicate that individuals spend the summer in the northern feeding grounds, migrate southward towards Okinawa using waters off the coast of Hokkaido as a corridor in the fall. Um, nevertheless, there is a possibility that Hokkaido area is a feeding ground for humpback whales. The environmental conditions, um, such as latitude and water temperature, are similar to those of known feeding areas, such as California. However, the feeding behavior of humpback whales has never been reported in this area. So, the, the um, ingredients are there. We just haven't seen a, a produced recipe proving that whales are feeding there. So then they look at, like, as the whales get down towards the breeding grounds, what's happening. In the breeding areas of Amami and Okinawa, um, the southward migration from Amami to Okinawa was more frequent in the first half of the breeding season. So the more northern point is Amami. They get there first, and then they start moving down a little further to Okinawa. Um, and then at, at the end of the season, same thing. The whales are at a further south point down in Okinawa. They move back up to Amami, and then they keep going north to the feeding grounds. But then, of course, within that trend, there's whales that ping pong back and forth whenever they want during the middle of the season. <laughs> so this suggests that whales don't necessarily pass through these areas, but also go back and forth um, between areas during the breeding season. The utilization of multiple areas within a breeding season has also been observed in um, regions of Hawaii and then further previous studies in Okinawa showed the same thing. Um, then there's also a similar southward trend early in the breeding season of whales passing by Okinawa and going to the Philippines and then doing the reverse late in the season coming up from the Philippines, going to Okinawa, and then keep moving up. Um. So then it's like, well, now what? Do you think that they go all the way from Kamchatka in Russia down and from the eastern Bering Sea down the Aleutians, go to Hokkaido in the fall, keep going down, stop at those first two breeding grounds, then go down to the Philippines and then come back up? And if so, is that all one connected area? I mean, this is the same conversation we have about Mexico and Central America. Like, you see lots of whales get sighted in, like, Cabo or in Banderas Bay, and then they're sighted in El Salvador well, or, or any something of these, like is that. This, is there an overlap down there? Like that's going that summer going south in the Philippines Mexico's, or oh no, yeah 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 some of those go to Antarctica right uh or not Antarctica. no um, no I think there, that's the furthest south they go wait hold on there's a, there's a population of whales somewhere over there though oh yeah like the Tongan ones I guess yeah would yeah be further that way yeah but that's still that's quite a bit way, further that's south way further though yeah. yeah. Wait, so there's nothing that goes, I guess it would be Australia. I guess mm -hmm. all of that's just further south that goes to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, Dang. I don't think there's an equator exchange like there is off the coast of the Americas. That's weird. I mean, the coastline's also way different shape on, is, on is, that side of well, the I guess Pacific. it's just to the peninsula, but what's the longest humpback um, migration population? Population wise, that's a good question. Like, I feel like maybe Costa Rica to Antarctica, but it depends on yeah. where they go in Antarctica. Yeah, they exactly. The peninsula, maybe not. There's also been whales sighted from um, Tonga that go all the way to the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's also really, really far. Damn. Yeah. All right. Well, breeding stock G, though, that goes from the Antarctic Peninsula all the way up to. Um, Central America is in the running for longest migration, which we will talk about in a future episode. I'm still researching all the details. Um, okay, so the right now the data in the study is showing that males were five times more frequently moving between all three breeding areas than females. Makes sense. Yeah. And um, they also usually had twice as many males than females in the breeding grounds when you took a snapshot of the gender ratio. Um, uh, here's the thing is, is they're, they're going off of like 
the whale being scratched up and stuff, huh? Like, because says they're identifying it. I think it's based on the catalogs behavior. of the known male versus female. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. other studies also indicated that males move more between the breeding grounds than females. It makes sense. Um, but it should be noted that males are behaviorally more identifiable than females. They are more likely to fluke and, um, really yeah so there is definitely some bias is that in in the data they're saying they're more likely to fluke is that like overall in all populations or this one i think breeding ground behavior wise oh, breeding the, ground the males are more likely to fluke than the female that's doesn't make any sense to me because the female times, would the be the females are resting yeah, but I guess the females are lazy, but then at the same time, the female is usually the one that like flukes up and then the males, if it's like a compod, they don't fluke. Yeah, but then when you're with a mom and calf, it takes forever to get an ID on the mom. She never flukes. Yeah, I guess it depends on the scenario, though, because you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, let's say we have Flopsy, like, and she has three mm -hmm. males, like two years, three years in a row now. She's been having males follow her around at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. And then she just will fluke up like super slow. And then the males mm -hmm. will like fast pace arch and go down. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? That's how usually like, okay, that's like, that's the one that's the female because she's like not worried about the, you know. Yeah, I guess it, it kind of just depends on their behavior and what they're doing. But you're more likely to get the male flukes than you are the female flukes. Um, there, but that being said, females have definitely changed between breeding grounds so that's pretty interesting because that's not super common um there was a small number of ids matched between hokkaido and all the way down in the mariana archipelago um and that's they said that it's a very small sample size so they definitely need more data to make sense of that information but when you look at the the underwater features of this whole region it does seem like the whales are using like the trenches and the islands to navigate just based on where they go and how they get there um, or how they seem to get there. They're definitely following like the edges of the island chain coming off the Kamchatka Peninsula, going down to Hokkaido. There's a pretty clear trench and set of islands right there. Then coming down the um, east coast of Japan, they can either keep going straight down go to Ogasawara, keep following that trench, go down to the Mariana Archipelago. Or when they come off Hokkaido, come down the coast of Japan, they can go west, follow that trench and the rest of the Japanese island chain and end up over at Amami or Okinawa and then keep following that trench and end up down in the Philippines. It's a lot of so, different routes. Yeah, but they're like kind of defined. Like if you took the map it looks like a roadway yeah so i don't know maybe some evidence as to how they're getting between send me over and i'll watch them <laughs> you know. send me over i'll happy whale them um so all these findings suggest the possibility of at least two groups um two populations that use certain areas more than others um they really need more data to figure out what the detail of the structure is for the Western North Pacific. Um, but this paper is a good start to continue to build um, a plan because they also need to be able to have a better conservation and management plan for these whales because they are all still considered endangered. Um, so they're hoping to do further genetic and possible satellite tagging analysis to really get a better sense of how these whales are moving and when. Fun. yeah this is i mean this is also a pretty busy stretch of coastline for global shipping when you look at where these whales are so you know you definitely want to make sure that your shipping traffic is a is shifted away from where these baby whales are and then you know your fishing efforts are also being mindful of where humpback whales are reproducing or using these migratory corridors, especially if they are pretty clearly defined along these trenches. If whales are using pretty narrow passages to get back and forth, then you could really have a defined area to, perfect, pr to protect them. Much easier to handle than trying to figure out like how they migrate between Alaska and, and Hawaii, potentially. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Whales in Japan. Pan and whales. <laughs> Long story short, let's go and count whales in Japan. <laughs> Yeah, um, if anyone went to Whale Tales virtually or in person, I think Nozomi was there as a lecturer. I didn't go to Whale Tales this year because I was out of town, but um, I think she's one of the lead authors on this paper. I think she was there kind of talking about this stuff. So, yeah, pretty cool. Did you learn some things? Science. Science. We learned science. All right. Well, I think that's all we have for you this week. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully we see you in April. If not, um, we'll just see you on the next episode. See you there. See you another time. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.